ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the confidence which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request made of him. The Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Let's stand here.
take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14. We'll be there in just a few moments. Uh, if you need the page on the Pew Bible, it's page 1242. We have been, we started last week a, a series, teaching series on the essence of prayer in the believer's life. And as we look at this as a church, and again try to study and understand the importance of prayer uh, in our lives, and certainly in the church's life, uh, we want to continue to uh, learn and, and grow as a result of it. We did find out last week, and we're reminded that prayer is, is very vital to the believer's walk. It's very essential to the church. Uh, and as the church grows, and as the church continues to grow in things of the Lord, uh, the, as the aspects of prayer are very, very important. So we want to continue. Be continued to be encouraged in that. Uh, one of the verses we looked at last week, if you recall, was Psalm 37, verse 4. And David, uh, as he was writing there, he said, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the what? The desires of your heart. And one of the things that we're reminded of is, if I'm in proper reverence to the Lord, that word desires there is not all my gimmies. <laughs> uh, he says, you know, you're, if your heart is in a right relationship with God, then your desires will be uh, what they ought to be for the Lord. I think we certainly can believe and know right now um, the church, things of God, are certainly being attacked in this country, are they not? Um, we see it all around us, and, and I think it's important for us to understand our role as believers and, and where we need to be thinking about so on and so forth. I think uh, the, the attack of Satan is showing up everywhere. Um, it's... People are being attacked, uh, whether you even mention the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's okay to mention uh, other you know, leaders, if you would, of false religions or other people. But as soon as you mention the name of Jesus Christ or mention God, uh, then, then that's, that's a no-no. And, and we see the punishment that comes as a result of it. Um, I was watching the news uh, the other day. It might have even been yesterday. And I saw a story about a young, a young college student. Some of you may have seen this. It was on a college campus, and there was a, they were doing some type of a seminar uh, that was centered around uh, opposing the transgender, uh, if you would, beliefs and, and what they're trying to promulgate. And he was sitting outside reading his Bible. And a young girl came up, and she was mad because he had the audacity to have a Bible out in public. And she ripped it out of his hands, tore some of the pages out of the Bible, and then ate them. There is a, a, just such a disdain for the things of God uh, in this country. And certainly we understand, you know, as we think about the forefathers and how things were set up, you know, even the beginning of this, of this country, uh, it certainly was not that way. Uh, the world of entertainment, we all know, mocks the things of God. Uh, and at the same time, wants to, if you would, put emphasis on other things that are, if you would, in opposition to, to the Word of God. Uh, we have friends, of course, the Fishers, who are uh, in Florida right now. They'll be heading back. I want to mention you should be praying for them. They'll be traveling back this week for uh, Ron's son's wedding. And uh, they, they have always loved Disney and uh, have enjoyed all of the things of Disney. And uh, they had, uh, as Florida residents, they had passes to go to Disney. And uh, they sh are running out, so they're not going to renew them uh, because of what's going on. But they did go, uh, I think a week or so ago, and uh, they sent a note to us and said, you cannot believe how things have changed in the public setting, even already in the, in the land of Disney, if you would. It's just sad, isn't it? Uh, when we see all these types of things, we see all of the fighting going on about uh, the, if you would, the disgusting stuff that's in the libraries for our kids and things that we maybe didn't even know about or, or weren't even concerned about before. But there's such an, such an attack, if you would, on, on things of the Lord that we as a church uh, need to be, we, we need to be, if you would, um, 
We need to not only be concerned, but I think church is time we wake up and get on our knees. Amen. Um, and I think sometimes we look at prayer and, and we emphasize more like, you know, what our needs are in, in terms of like somebody's sick. And there's nothing wrong with praying for sick. And the Lord tells us to intercede for others, right? But sometimes we fail to, to realize how important the church can be. And I, I, that's why we want to uh, take time to do all of this. We see churches today that are infiltrated by false teaching. Um, pastors who are uh, kind of socializing the, the gospel, socializing things of the word just to make it, uh, if you would, entertaining or appealing. And there, there's, the Bible's full of great, great promises and excitement and joy, is it not? You know, it, but at the same time, we learn so much about how we ought to be living our lives and the importance of it. Um, Janet mentioned it in the announcements, and I'll just mention to you again. Um, you know, Brother Dennis is going to be starting on Wednesday night. But one of the things that has overtaken some of our churches in this, in, the, in our own community, as well as across this country, uh, is the, the doctrine of what's called outer darkness. And to be honest with you, when you look at the aspect of rewards for the believer uh, and so on, it it's almost makes it scary. It almost makes you, you feel like there's no hope uh, for the glories in heaven that God has prepared. Uh, you need to be here for that on Wednesday night. Uh, Dennis is going to be uh, sharing uh, just some important things. But I think the list goes on and on. Uh, but it's time for us to, to realize that we need to be praying for God's intervention, not only in the church, in our own individual lives, but certainly in, in this nation as well. So we're going to take a look at that today, and we'd like to begin uh, this morning, looking here in John chapter 14, at some of the necessities for our prayers to be answered. You know, we, what, is, what is it that we as a believer need to keep in mind? Uh, when it comes to praying and the necessity of answer prayer. Father, teach us from your word, I pray. Uh, help us to uh, just just be drawn more closely, if I would, uh, Lord, to this aspect of prayer uh, in the church, in the body of believers. I pray that you would teach us from your word today, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just share with you three aspects today of uh, the necessity, if you would, for answer prayer, what we really need to be uh, thinking about. Um, it's probably not a whole lot of new uh, things that you haven't heard before, but things that we need to be reminded of as a church so that we can be reinvigorated in this aspect of prayer in our lives. Uh, we'll take a look today, Lord willing, at three, uh, and then uh, a few more next week as well as we take a look at this particular aspect. The first thing that I want you to, to think about and be reminded of is that uh, God, when we come to God in prayer, we pray to God the Father, in the name of whom? Jesus Christ. So we need to understand the importance of coming to God in prayer in Jesus' name, in his presence in our lives. Uh, we know that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We know all of those verses. We understand. We've, we've looked at those many times before. Here in John chapter 14, would you look at verse 6? Uh, this is the aspect of our eternal uh, relationship with God. He says, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. And then the last part of that verse, no man comes unto the Father, how? Except through or by me. The, the importance uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, his name in, in our walk with God. But then I want you to drop down just a few verses, if you would, to verse 13 of the same chapter. In this particular verse, Jesus continues to teach his disciples. And notice what he's, he's talking about. We read this in our responsive reading a few moments ago. Jesus says in verse 13, whatever you ask, church, what's the next three words? In my name. And you should notice it's capitalized, the word my, is it not? It's, it's in reference to Christ. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Go over to chapter 16, same book. John chapter 16, verse 23. Jesus says, In that day uh, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father, here's that phrase again, what is it? In my name he will give you. Now, we're not going to take time this morning to go into the aspect of, is this praying, okay, Lord, I want this, I want this, and I pray this in Jesus' name. It's an understanding as David learned of praying the desires of God's heart. Uh, so it isn't just our wants. It's the understanding of the desires of God as he works in our life. Look, 
and, and again, just to remind all of us, this is done through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, what he has done on the cross for us. We believe as, as, as Christians, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ died on the cross for our sins. Amen? Amen. Okay? And that death on the cross, as a result of our belief in him, gives us eternal life. Okay? So here we are walking through this life now, and we have the opportunity to come to the Lord uh, because as we pray, we do it, we're doing it in his name. Uh, let me just give you this illustration, something for you to think about. How many of you, now this is pre-GPS days, all right, uh, or your phone days. Uh, maybe some of you even today, because I know every once in a while I'll have the GPS or I'll have the phone on, and they, they tell me to turn left, and I clearly am supposed to turn right. I don't know why Siri's so confused, but sometimes she is. But, you know, you come in, you, have you ever had anybody stop you and ask you for directions to some place in town? You know, they're out of town and they stop in and say, do you know where, do you know where Cranex is? Oh, yeah, I know where Cranex is. And, and here we are sitting in Sharpsville, and I've got to tell them how to get to Cranex. And so I'll say to them, okay, well, you go to this stop sign, you turn left, uh, you go up to the stoplight, and the first stoplight you come to, then you turn right, then you go up that road for, oh, for a couple miles or so. You come to a restaurant, I used to say Denny's, and now it's an empty lot. And then you turn, and by the time you get done, they're looking at you, they're completely confused. Because they haven't written anything down, they can't remember all of those things. And then after a while you say to them, you know what, I'm headed in that direction, why don't you just follow me? Think about that in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, your relationship to God. Jesus doesn't just say, oh, he's up there, go. Jesus says, follow me. Gives us, if you would, that, that assurance and that authority uh, that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we know that we have eternal life through what Christ has done on the cross. We already mentioned that. But that's all because of Christ. It's all because of his merit, what Christ has done on the cross. Church, you could be the the best person on earth, okay? Todd may be old. He's a good guy, <laughs> all right? But I want to tell you something. You're not going to get to heaven on the merits of Todd. Don't say anything, darling. <laughs> we, we are going to spend our eternity with, Christ, with, with God himself because of what Christ has done. It's on, on his merit. Um, let's suppose... Um, you're down in Pittsburgh someday, and uh, somebody has written you, you know, you need, you need to cash a check for some reason. You don't have your debit card. and So you go into a bank down there, and uh, you say, can I cash a check? And the first question they're going to ask you is, is, do you have an account here? No. Um, well, then we can't help you out. But it just so happens, while you're standing there, your good friend, Kenny Pickett, or Ben Roethlisberger, come walking into the bank. And they walk up and they start talking to you and so on and so forth. And they write a check out to you and cash it because that's their bank. You got your money on their merit, did you not? Because you, you weren't able to do it on your own. All right, now make, it, make the spiritual, I know that's way off, baby. Make a spiritual <laughs> application to Christ. Okay, our walk with God, uh, our eternity with God, everything is on the merit of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen? That, that's where it is. And so once you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then even though you and I may be spiritually bankrupt as human beings, Jesus Christ gives us authority and access to God. Aren't you grateful for that? That you have access to the throne. You know, and I remember uh, when we were trying to trying to teach this principle, you know, to, to kids or even to teenagers and so on. We remember the old red line that they, they used to show on the movies, you know, you had the hot line or the hot wire to the President of the United States, you know, it was always a red phone. You know, you have that access. You know, you have that access to God, but only because of Christ. It's not your merits. It's not my merits. All right? This is why the, the, the false teaching of some churches say, well, you got to go to so-and-so, you got to go to a certain person in the church, and they have to give you access to God. That's not biblical, my friends. I have direct access to God because of my walk with Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, the first, the first principle is very simply this. You, you come to God and you do so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's on his merit. And then the second aspect, again, a verse we had looked at. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you would turn over to Ephesians for just a moment, chapter 6. 
when we come to God and, and we're praying to God, we're coming to Him, we do so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we, we also do it, if you would, we come by praying uh, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit who ministers in our lives. Now, there's some very, just some awesome teaching about this I want us to see here this morning. But look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. This is the uh, armor of God. And, and throughout that, you can begin reading that uh, and be reminded of it, starting there in verse 10. But notice what verse 18 says. And sometimes uh, when we talk about the armor of God, we stop at the end of verse 17. And we, we fail to, to remember part of the armor of God is found in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. How? It's the next three words. In the Spirit. So it's, it's my, my understanding that the Spirit of God is present. Uh, Jude says in verse 20, he says very simply this, Beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So it's, it's that Spirit's presence in my life. You say, well, why is that so important? Okay, go to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. Uh, the Pew Bible is page 1301 if you need it. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And again, this verse was in our uh, reading just a few moments ago. But it, this, is, this is one of the most awesome verses for the believer when it comes to prayer. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Let's look at it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. Look at the rest of this verse. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Did you, did you grasp that verse? Look at it again. The Spirit helps in our weaknesses because we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. We cannot pray without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the precious thing about being a believer is, once we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we accept all that he's done for us, our forgiveness of sins, all of the aspects of our salvation, we now have the Holy Spirit present living inside of us amen and that spirit is what the holy spirit and again remember all of this the holy spirit jesus christ god all three in one we're not going to go into the trinity this morning but you need to understand the importance of the holy spirit in our lives you can't pray without him and when you surrender and, and i surrender my life in prayer to to through the holy spirit he molds this verse says kind of molds our prayers he guides me and energizes the prayer so that as a result of it, God is, is glorified and he sustains my prayer life. Notice what he says there at the end of that verse. He says it's with groanings that you can't understand. When you study this, what you get from that word groaning is the groaning and the noise and the pain that comes with childbirth. I've never experienced that. But I have experienced the groaning and the yelling and the screaming and the tearing of the hair off my arms in the process of children being born. That groaning, he says, it's, all, it's, that, it's that stomach, if you would, guttural prayer. It's, that, it's the Holy Spirit doing it. Listen, friends, prayer is, is a work of God in your life. It's, it's, not, it's not just some fluffy, easy-going thing. It's, it's a work of God in your life. And I want to tell you something. When you pray, and I pray, the devil doesn't want that to be going on. So all the things you see going on around you, all the things that we're experiencing, we see Satan doing all kinds of things and works here on, on this earth. Hallelujah! I've got a helper in the Holy Spirit who can guide me and teach me and help me when it comes to praying. You know, because we don't, we, don't, we don't always even know. That. He says, you don't even know what to pray for in, in a right way. I, I was trying to think of an example of this, and uh, I hope you'll understand it. But 
you, let's say you have a family member who's 90 years old. I don't want to say 96 because you'll think it's my mother-in-law, but it isn't. You have somebody who's, who's older and they're, and they're having health problems and you're spending time with them and, and you, you, want, you want to do and so you want to pray for them. And as a believer, you, you are kind of, I don't know what, you, you, you don't know how to really pray. Okay, so do I, do I pray, God, that you heal that person and keep them with us here on this earth? Or do I pray, God, let them come into your presence and enjoy your presence? That's a hard prayer, isn't it? That's a hard thing because we don't know how to really pray. In it. Our, our heart says, I want them to be here forever. But then we say, you know what? God, boy, being in God's presence would be so much better for them, even though it's hard for me. And we, we don't often, sometimes we don't even know how to pray. So that's where the Holy Spirit is, is working in our life. And we're not, not, pray, not, not trying to minimize praying for people's health needs, because that is important, is it not? We're, we're not saying don't, don't minimize the aspect of prayer. But you know what? I wonder, I wonder, I know this is on tape, but I wonder, I wonder, uh, how, how do I say this? How? It seems sometimes we spend more time praying to keep people out of heaven than we do praying for lost souls to get into heaven. Does that make sense? We, we, are, we are so consumed with physical needs and material needs that we oftentimes forget the spiritual part of it and the importance of it. That's why the Holy Spirit is there to help us so that, so that we better know if you would, how to pray, so that, so that we understand. I wonder how much time we're concentrating praying on, on spiritual needs and, and praying for those that are, that are outside of Christ. You know, um, you know sometimes we spend, we spend time, you know, praying for our dog, you know, that's sick. And it's okay. I mean, your dog's sick. You don't want it to have problems. Then, then we do about the spiritual things. Maybe you're not like that, but but I think it happens a lot. I uh, I somebody gave me this book years ago, and I, I shared a couple of devotions out of it yesterday with our men at, at our devotion and breakfast time together. Um, but there was there's a, a little one. I want to I want to read this for you. It's called "Seize the Moment." I think sometimes we we don't realize the importance of taking advantage. Of opportunities to pray for those that are that are struggling spiritually, those that are outside of Christ, or even sharing the gospel of Christ. You know, we all, we all struggle sometimes, do we not? Uh, when it comes to actually talking to people about God, talking about to people, we're afraid. You know, they might they might make fun of us, or we won't have the right words to say. Um, and uh, this particular writer, uh, <clears throat> Steve Chapman, he uh, is a deer hunter. And he writes, writes on different topics uh, throughout it. And one of them he wrote was called Seize the Moment. And he, he was using the verse in 1 Peter chapter 3 where, where Peter says we should always be ready to give an answer uh, to those that ask of us. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, he, he puts it this way. He says, I've seen and heard some interesting ways that people have been known the sobering truth that someday all of us are going to meet our maker. One of my favorite examples, he said, took place in Knoxville, Tennessee. A farmer owned some land at one end of a regional commercial airport. And though personally I never saw it, I was told that on a hillside, for all the passengers and crew to see as they departed the runway, the farmer had constructed a big message on a board. He said, I'm not sure what material he used, but the words were, prepare to meet thy God, as they're taking off. I have a feeling, he said, the cleverly placed warning found its way into many a heart, especially if there was a turbulence on takeoff or a sudden unusual mechanical noise. The nervous soul souls were probably quite moved by the truth in the farmer's message. I'm not sure if the guy's sermon on his mount is still there, but I have no doubt that it remains in the minds and hearts of those who saw it. Another timely delivery of the get ready message was made by my son, Nathan. He was 15 years old when he and I were walking down our sidewalk on the way to our van. My wife and our daughter were already in the car, 
along with some other good friends of ours who had been visiting us. It was a Sunday morning, and we were going to church. For some strange reason, I asked, Son, would you like to drive us? His learner's permit was just a few weeks old, and I honestly don't know what possessed me to put our guests in such danger. Before I could recant, Nathan excitedly responded, Oh, Dad, I'd love to. So I gave him the keys, and he climbed into the driver's seat. I got in through the side door, smiled at our company, sat down in my seat, and put on my helmet. Okay, we get the helmet. Nathan started the engine, and as I had taught him, he let it warm up a little bit. And during the brief wait, he decided to do a little evangelism. He turned in his chair, looked back through the van, and everyone knew he was a novice driver, and there was a certain tension in the air. And with a sheepish grin, he asked, is everyone, and then he paused, just so everybody would be attention, is everybody saved? I'm sure his well-timed inquiry was as much for me as anyone else. He knew how unsettled I was by allowing him to drive, so he seized the moment. We all got a good laugh, and then secretly tightened our seat belts when he turned to face the front. Taking advantage of opportunity is a key to effective evangelism in our daily lives. Okay, now, that's the everyday aspect. How much time do we spend praying for those that we know that aren't believers? Or are we focusing more, if you would, on our physical needs? Again, nothing wrong with the physical, is there? But how much time do we spend focusing on that rather than on the moments? You say, okay, so I, I check the box. You know, I, 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 I understand I come to God in the power of the Lord. I, I understand the, the importance of, of involving the Holy Spirit in my prayer life. Number three, in this particular aspect of the necessities, is very, very important. Church, we have to have an honest and obedient relationship with God when it comes to spending time in prayer. What do we mean by that? Very simply, here's what David says. And now remember, David in the Old Testament, in all of the aspects of David, uh, David is called a man after whom? His heart. After God's heart, right? So we, we understand that David, even though, even though he, he, he made a lot of mistakes, did he not? And the guy committed murder. All right? He committed adultery. So we're not talking about a, a sinless guy. All right? So... But David says in Psalm chapter 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, you know what the rest of the verse says? The Lord will not hear me. Listen to that. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You say, okay, well, preacher, nobody's, nobody's perfect. We all sin, right? I'm not the only one, I hope. Okay, a couple heads. There's no such thing as sinless perfection in the body, in, in, a, in, our, in our lives. The only one who is perfect and sinless is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's, he's, notice this word regard in that verse. And again, if, if you don't have it, if you didn't turn to it, that's all right. But Psalm 66, 18, he says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That, that word regard is the idea of gazing steadily on something, um, putting my full attention to that sin, allowing that sin, if you would, to have a, a higher place in my life than living the way God wants me to. So that regard is, is a very important uh, verse. It's, it's almost like, um, you know, if you have a pet, you know, you carry your pet around, you know, you, you, know, you pet the head of the dog or the cat or whatever, snake, whatever it is you have. And uh, it's almost like you're regarding, you're carrying, you're carrying some sin in your life, and you're saying to God, okay, well, God, here's what, here's what I desire of you, all the while you're still petting that sin. That, that sin is still has too much of a, it has a place in your life. It, it isn't the idea of, you know, I'm, I'm going down the street and I, I commit sin randomly. You know, you come up with what you want. That's not the idea. The idea is that there's some aspect of my life 
which God is not pleased with, and it's sin, and, and I'm, giving it, I'm giving it priority, if you will. I'm allowing it to be there. I'm allowing it to have a place in my life. That's the idea of regarding sin. Okay, he's not talking about sinless perfection. But David, David knew better than to come to God when he had sin in his life. He, he understood that. Um, the prophet Isaiah, go, go to the Old Testament just quickly. If you need it, it's page 783 in, in your Bibles there, the Pew Bibles. God, God, God's word to Israel in Isaiah, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 1. God's word to Israel through the prophet Isaiah is a, is a good example uh, to us even as, as believers. When we think about the importance of having my life in my relationship to God, being where it needs to be, okay, when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to this aspect of prayer. Look at, look at here in Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, we're going to go down to verse 13. <clears throat> Begin reading in verse 13. And again, this, if you would, this, this challenge and this speaking to uh, Israel is something that we also could take as an example to us. He says in verse 13, Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of the, assembly, the assemblies. I cannot endure what? Iniquity and the sacred meeting. So if you just think about what the children of Israel did with all of their, uh, all of their if you would, the... Uh, <clears throat> The Passover and all of the things that were involved in, in those aspects of their of their walk in that day. He says, Don't come for all of those and have iniquity in your life. Sin. And again, just try to grab, if you would, how you could apply this even, even as an example to us. Your new moons, verse 14, your appointed feast. My soul hates those. They're a trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you may make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. And we're not going to go into all of the teaching here, but it's an understanding that they were not living the way God wanted them to do. The children of Israel were involved with all kinds of sinful nations, all kinds of, of things that God says, you know, you're coming to me with all these sacrifices. And you think that's okay. He says, but I, I don't hear you because of the sin that's in your life. Notice what he says in verse 16. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. He's just given some things that they were doing. Now come, verse 18, and let us reason together, says the Lord. And here's the verse you probably know. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow, as a result of coming to him. If you are willing, verse 19, and obedient, you shall then eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Go over to chapter 59, same book. The prophet continues to speak. Chapter 59, the first couple of verses. <clears throat> Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. All right, you just stop there for a minute and reflect on that verse. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Listen, church, it's foolish for us to think that we're going to pray to God and ask him to, to answer prayers if we're living in some sinful state in our life. It's as simple as that. So we're praying to God because of what Jesus has done for us. He died on the cross for us. He died on the cross for our sins. We, we understand the presence of the Holy Spirit and His working in our life as a believer. But then, I need to keep in mind, my walk with God is vital to God hearing and answering my prayers. That's the challenge that we see in these verses. Here's the great news. 
What does the prophet say there? God's not deaf. Are you grateful for that? You know, God is not deaf. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us. Okay? It's not that aspect, not regarding, not keeping that in my life, but, but turning that over to the Lord. Listen, listen church, we have, we have such great hope and blessing as a believer. You know, God has provided eternal life for us. He's given us access to him, his very throne, into his very presence through prayer. So what is it then that we as individuals and even as a church can, can take and can, and can understand? Because God, God loves us, amen, and he, he wants the best for us. We've looked at that quite often in our studies. Prayer is that means of walking with God. And, and it's so important in, in, my le- in my life. So what do we do as a church? Let me encourage you, first of all, to, to begin to examine your own our own individual prayer life. Do you know what? Get a hold of a couple people in the church. If you come to the Bible study on Wednesday, show up at 6 o'clock and go to one of the rooms back there and and the two or three of you get together and just pray together. Get on the phone, call somebody, and just spend a few moments praying about the spiritual matters, about praying for our church, praying for its ministry, praying for its people, pray for our spiritual growth, our numerical growth, whatever God is leading you in. But you're making that prayer life, if you would, a a matter of importance in your life. And examining our own lives so that we know that our relationship is open and honest with God. And as a result, God's promise is, I will what? Hear. And as we pray in the desires of Him in our heart, He hears us. Prayer is so vital to your life. It's so vital to my life as a believer. Understand the necessities and the importance of it. As we continue to study that, I pray that the Lord would direct us in our thoughts. Father, thank you. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And and Father, we are so grateful for what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And I, I just pray, Father, this morning that we would grasp the importance of our walk with you and then, Lord, in, in so doing, as a church, as a as body of believers, we, we want to spend time uh, seeking the spiritual needs of those that we know, of our own lives, and certainly of the church itself. And then, Father, even for this nation, as we think about all of the things that are transparent in there as well. Might we uh, indeed make you uh, important in our lives when it comes to our prayer, prayer walk? Uh, Father, just continue to teach us about the essence of prayer in our life and the necessity of prayer and allowing God through His Spirit to direct us. Father, you've blessed us with with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives to to help us to know how to pray. Help us not to, to take that for granted. Father, help us to really become effective prayer warriors for you. And then even as Paul says, that we would ceasingly do that. We would continue to do that all at all times in our lives. And we'll give you the thanks for what you do. Father, prayer is, is what can bind our hearts together as a church and as a church family. And so I would just ask that you would just multiply this aspect in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.